Okay, I think we, uh, we can get started. This is a welcome to the uh, M-Cubed uh, weekly seminar. And uh, today is uh, our pleasure to have Laura Slavinsky here from uh, NOAA, Physical uh, Science Lab. And she's a research uh, scientist there in the Modeling and Data Simulation Division. Uh, Laura received her PhD in 2013, 2014, 2013 in uh, Applied Math at Brown University. Uh, followed by a postdoc at Woods Hole. Uh, during graduate school, she visited NCAR to work with uh, Chris here on particle filters and fell in love with Boulder. And uh, she took a position with Ceres in 2015 uh, at, at uh, Ceres at NOAA to help develop a new version of the 20th century uh, current reanalysis, uh, which is a 200-year uh, reconstruction of global weather assimilating uh, only uh, surface pressure observations. In 2003, she switched over to, uh, NOAA, to a NOAA, federal NOAA position and continues to work on data assimilation and methods and reanalysis. And today, we'll hear a seminar, an hourly cycling global data simulation system. All right. All right, hi everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, yeah, so I've been at the Physical Sciences Lab in some uh, capacity for the past eight years uh, and recently switched to be uh, fed, but this is work that I started actually while I was a series, so um, sort of acknowledging series here, and then this is also work with lots of collaborators, both within PSL, uh, another lab within NOAA, uh, and at EMC. So um, just to provide some motivation, the current NOAA Global Weather Prediction System uses six hourly assimilation cycles. Um, and so what that means is that basically if our nominal analysis time is 6Z, it's going, we're going to assimilate observations from 3Z to 9Z. We'll actually produce analyses at 3, 6, and 9 with our 4D methods. And then we'll initialize a forecast at the end of that window, let's say uh, at 9Z, um, we'll run a shorter forecast just for the next cycle to provide the background, but then we'll also spin up some uh, longer forecasts that we would serve to the public and our stakeholders, and then move along. Okay, so basic um, six hourly assimilation system. But six hours might not be frequent enough to handle uh, rapid error growth in certain fast moving systems. For example, hurricanes was one of the primary motivations of this work initially. Um, in addition, we have our regional models, right? I'm talking about the global weather system, uh, weather prediction system in this work, but our regional models already run at at least hourly, uh, if not more frequently, but they need lateral boundary conditions, right? And so uh, now with NOAA's uh, regional HER model, we have an intermediary called the RAP, which is its job is really just to go from the global system down to the regional system to provide um, boundary conditions for the HER. And that's its only job. And so if we had an hourly updating global system, then we wouldn't need to run this intermediary system. And this is um, something that we're looking towards in the next, when the RRFS actually uh, goes operational. Um, we also hypothesize that as we get more observations that are high temporal frequency, we'll be able to use them more effectively if we actually update our system more frequently. And then finally, I'll mention that there seems to be this community push towards what's called continuous data assimilation in which observations are assimilated as soon as they become available. So the, the you know, far limit of that would be as soon as you get an observation, you assimilate it, and then you forecast as far as you need, a minute or two, get another observation and assimilate it. Um, obviously, we're not there yet, but ECMWF is, has their version of continuous DA where they're adding in new observations in each of their 40-bar um, outer loops. And then I've heard a rumor just this week, actually, that the UK Met Office is also moving towards hourly updates in their system. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was a secret or not. But. <laughs> so this motivates the development at NOAA of uh, a, actually a real-time hourly updating global assimilation system. And the real-time part is actually pretty key because of the way the observations come in. Um, but I'm going to get to that in a little bit. And just in the sort of, in the beginning, let's just look at what could we gain, if anything, by updating every hour instead of every six hours assuming we have all of our observations now, right, at any given time. So I'll, I'll compare two experiments here, um, one where we update six hourly, uh, and one where we update hourly using the same observations just at an hourly cadence. Uh, my experiments, just briefly, I'm, I'm running for a single month 
uh, using a version of the GFS that was operational, I guess, a year or two ago, um, at, but at, at about a half a degree resolution, which is coarser resolution that we run in operations. Um, I'll be showing results using a hybrid 4D EN VAR, which is similar to what's used in operations, but just with a single resolution, so not, not the same as what's used in operations. Um, but basically, it's a hybrid ensemble static covariance. Uh, and in the hourly experiment, it's all going to uh, simplify to 3D EN VAR because we just have a single hour window. So if we go back to our cartoon, we have what the six hourly system looks like at the top. And for the hourly system, we're going to take this, this pink shading in the six hourly is our six hour observation window. And we're just going to chop that into six hour long observation windows, right? And that's what's shown down here. The hourly observation windows are centered on the hour. So there's a little bit of, you know, 30 minutes at the beginning and 30 minutes at the end that we kind of have to shift around and handle. Um, but I don't think the impacts of that are going to be too significant. But this is the main idea. And what I'm going to show for the most part in my results are going to be uh, the OMF statistics. So the six hour forecast RMS fit to observations in the next window. And so what that means is we want to compare these two as apples to apples as we can, um, given that we have these differences in the observation dumps. And so for the six hourly system, as I showed before, this means initializing from an analysis at 9Z, spinning off a six hour forecast that'll cover the next six hours, and we'll compare those fields to the observations in that green window centered on 12Z. So to avoid giving an unfair advantage to our hourly results, we're actually, instead of initializing at 9Z, we're going to initialize at 8Z, because that will have seen observations up to 830. So if we initialized from 9Z, we would be giving it an extra 30 minutes of observations that we wouldn't have given in the six hourly. So we're going to slightly disadvantage the hourly system just to make sure that any impacts we see aren't because of these extra 30 minutes, even though it shouldn't matter too much. So we'll, and the other thing that means though is that it'll actually, our hourly system actually ends up being a slightly longer forecast that we're comparing to. So keep that in mind that we're sort of giving a little bit of a disadvantage to the hourly system. Despite that disadvantage, we see significant improvements in these RMS fits to the observations. So what I'm showing here are vertical profiles of these OMF statistics for wind, vector wind on the left and temperature on the right. Um, right, so these are vertical profiles. Everywhere that's yellow means that it is a significant difference, 95%. So all levels are significant here. And we see the biggest differences are in wind, where the hourly significantly improves upon the six hourly in, these, in this metric. Um, smaller improvements, but still significant improvements in temperature. Um, so that was you know, really great, really promising. Despite the little bit of disadvantage that we're giving to the hourly system, we still end up um, with significant improvements in this metric. So this is for the six hour forecasts. I can also look at longer forecasts. Um, the only one I have on here is 12 hours. I've looked at a little bit longer as well. Um, but these improvements tend to die out pretty quickly. So when we look at our 12 hour forecast fits, um, there's much less significance. Differences are much smaller, although they're still sort of there in wind, much less so in temperature, I would say. Um, and then if we go out to 24 hours, it pretty much goes away. And if we go out even longer, I just want to mention it doesn't, the hourly doesn't surpass in terms of error. They sort of just converge. They both end up having um, about the same size errors. Um, so it doesn't, it wouldn't hurt our long forecast, but we're not seeing any improvement in the forecast out much beyond 12 hours, which um, was a little disappointing, but it sort of happens, right? So this was all when we're just assuming that our observations are available as soon as we want, right? As soon as they're taken, they're available. Um, but if we wanted to actually implement this operationally, that's not going to be the case. The main challenge that we're going to have to deal with in real time uh, is what we call data latency, or basically the, the um, difference between when an observation shows up in your operational center and when it was taken. And that difference can actually be quite large. So what I'm showing here is a plot of data latency on the x-axis and the percent of the observations um, received with that latency. So if we were to do 
what I had shown in the cartoon before, where it's just one hour windows moving along. We would have to, by sort of construction, have a, a data cutoff of 30 to 60 minutes, right? You'd only be able to assimilate observations that are valid in the past hour that have arrived within you know, minutes of when they were taken. And if we did that, you can see I have this separated by platform, but the um, satellite are most of the observations going into the total in black here. If we had a cutoff, even being generous of an hour, we would get le less than half, half or less than half of our total observing system. So any benefits we would get from actually cycling hourly, we would likely lose by not using half of our observing system. We would have most of our aircraft, luckily, at that point, but we'd lose a lot of satellite data. If we wanted to use, say, 90% of our satellite data, we need to wait at least two, if not three hours, to be able to get most of our observations. Um, so that's, that's the main challenge that we're, that we're trying to deal with here. In the six-hourly system, this is still a challenge, but it's managed with two update cycles. So we have what's called the GFS, or the Global Forecast System cutoff, or an early cutoff, and the GDAS, the Global Data Assimilation System, or the late cutoff. It seems very, um, these names can be very confusing, but it actually sort of makes sense. The GFS, the early cutoff, is right at the end of the assimilation window, and that's for running those long forecasts in real time. When you need forecasts for the next few hours, um, for the public, for the stakeholders, those need to be run as soon as possible. So this cutoff is prioritizing timeliness, right? But it's not gonna get as many of those late arriving observations at the end of the assimilation window um, because it cuts off right at the end of the window. The GDAS cutoff, the late one, waits another three hours. And that's specifically for the cycling DA system. So because you can't run this 12Z analysis until 15Z anyway, you have some wiggle room in terms of waiting for more observations at the end of this pink window to actually come in. So you wait until 12Z in real time, you get a lot of those late arriving observations from like seven to nine Z, um, and then you are able to make a better analysis to provide a better background for your next cycle. So the early cutoff is prioritizing the timeliness, the late cutoff is prioritizing accuracy for your subsequent DA cycle. Um, and I just wanted to mention that, I will come back to those, that GFS, GDAS later, so, um, but I'll remind you. But we can't really do this in the hourly system, right? We don't have this like six hour window that we have the wiggle room to wait until the next cycle, um, until we need to run the next cycle, so it's still a challenge for, for the hourly system. So one way that we could deal with this is what we call catch-up cycles. Similar things are also called partial cycling, if um, you're familiar with those terms. And the idea behind catch-up cycles is that um, basically you do cycle with that one hourly window that I'd shown earlier, right? The one that's not gonna get those um, high latency late arriving observations. But instead of just doing that forever, you restart from a different cycling system that has seen high latency observations every six hours. So for example, from that GDAS system that I showed in the previous slide. So I'll try to walk through this um, cartoon a little bit. Let's assume that at 3Z we have some um, analysis from our, our previous cycle. We'll initialize from 3Z our hourly system. So we'd produce an analysis at 4Z that will have seen observations just in the hour surrounding 4Z move on to 5Z, and so on in real time. Again, these are not gonna see those high latency observations though. And then at 12Z in real time, we would run our GDAS cycle on in this pink box. So we'd assimilate observations from 3D, 3Z to 9Z. Because we're waiting until 12, we will have gotten the high latency observations. We'll produce our, this is now a six hourly cycling system, analysis at the end of that window and we'll then restart an hourly cycling system from that. It's called catch-up because these first three red um, analyses, 10, 11, and 12, are being run at 12Z in real time. So they're trying to catch up to real time because if you want real-time hourly analyses, you, you wanna be able to run them in real time. So um, the 12 or 13 would be your first actual real-time hourly analysis. Okay. It's really confusing to explain, which kind of is like 
one disadvantage of trying to actually run this method in, in um, operations, right? Other disadvantages, obviously, you're still running a six hourly system and you're just adding an hourly system on top of that. Um, you can imagine that the performance of the hourly system is going to have sort of a six hourly cycle to it as you don't assimilate the high latency observations. Each subsequent analysis could get worse and worse. <laughs> Uh, and you're losing any benefits, right? Every six hours, you're restarting from a six hourly system. So you would only see those benefits for a little bit, and then they would kind of get washed out and restarted from a six hourly system. So it's not a very satisfying uh, solution, but it is a possibility. So I'll include it in some comparisons. The other solution that we thought was more promising, definitely more interesting, is uh, overlapping windows. So essentially, here you would update every hour but you would assimilate observations um, valid in the past three hours and that have arrived in the past hour. So this part arrived within the past hour means that you're only assimilating each observation once. So for example, in our first cycle, we would assimilate observations in this three and a half hour window, the blue window. We get our nominal analysis at 3Z. We'd run our forecast, go to our second cycle at 4Z, which would assimilate observations in the pink window from 1 to 4.30, but only those that we have, that have shown up in the past hour. So only those that weren't assimilated in the blue, the first cycle, um, would be assimilated in the pink. And then the green third cycle would give us yet another chance to assimilate those really late arriving observations between 2 and 3. So I have to emphasize that each observation is only assimilated once because I get asked this every time I give this talk, how I deal with duplicate observations. We filter them out, basically. They don't get assimilated. And so this method was originally presented, um, presented by Tim Payne at UK Met Office, um, but they hadn't done it for an operational system. So this was sort of the first foray into actually doing this in a near operational system. So um, we have some experiments with uh, those solutions. Uh, these experiments were actually run before the ones that I showed before, so they use a slightly older version of the GFS, um, a not very ideal time period to have, have run an operational test on, but that's what we had available. Um, again, still at half a degree. And I'll show results from three experiments now. We still have our six hourly non-overlapping control, closest to what's run in operations. Um, we have catch-up cycles, which is the hourly non-overlapping cycles that get initialized from the control every six hours. And then the overlapping windows will be in blue. Uh, the other one difference from the earlier experiments I showed is that we're going to simplify and just use a hybrid gain ensemble Kalman filter now, um, which is basically an ENKF, but the increment is a linear combination of the 3D var and the ENKF increments. Um, and so this isn't as good as the hybrid 40 e var, but it actually works pretty well, and it's much faster and much cheaper. So it's pretty good for um, looking at comparisons for things like this. <laughs> the other big difference with the other experiments I showed is that these experiments will actually have observations with real data latency. Um, these were actually produced by the observation processing team at NSEP in real time. So like by real data latency, it's real data latency. They were made in real time. Um, partially that's because uh, the receipt time metadata is not kept in the observation information. Um, it would be, everything would be a lot easier if it was. So if anyone from the Joint Center is on this call, keeping that in mind, um, keep that receipt time metadata. Uh, so we had to actually run our own uh, pre-processing, post-processing on these observations to remove those duplicates because they aren't actually removed by the NSEP processing team. Um, and without having the receipt time, it gets kind of messy. So it's actually a non-trivial effort that had to go into that. We also had some, not very much, but some tuning to the hourly system. So um, the six hourly pretty much has been tuned for operations, so we weren't too worried about that. For the hourly system, we had to do some some of the obvious things, right? We inf increased the inflation because if you only have an hour background, your ensemble is not going to spread out as much <laughs> as it would in six hours. So we increased the inflation. Um, and then we didn't actually change the static B in the 3D var itself. So we just decreased the weight that it's given. Instead of trying to retune the B, we just gave it less weight. 
So if we look at those same vertical profile RMS fits to observations, um, again, this is for a different month and a different version of the GFS. So the qualitative differences with the earlier results I'm not too concerned about. Um, but we do still see significant differences, significant improvement um, with the overlapping windows method that's in blue versus the six hourly control was in black and then those catch up cycles were in orange. So in this metric, the control and the catch up cycles actually perform almost identically. I think that actually has to do with the metric because we're doing this six hour forecast initialized from the end of the six hour window and so it's not um, giving very much, the catch up cycles aren't gonna give you much benefit there but they would still give you a benefit in terms of like having hourly analyses for whatever um, purposes you would need. But anyway, this is the metric that we wanted to look at. So um, and again, the yellow shading is showing where there's significant differences between the control and the overlapping windows. So we still see significant improvements with overlapping windows, which is um, also really great to see. And again, just to um, remind you, all the forecasts were initialized from analyses that have seen about the same observations, so we're not <clears throat> giving the advantage to the hourly system just because it is going faster. Um, and this work was published uh, two years ago now. Um, sort of a natural question to ask then is how much could you gain if we didn't have to deal with latency in the observations? What's the improvement by using overlapping windows that I showed in the previous slide and assuming all the observations arrive immediately? Um, and actually the improvement is not as big as we had sort of guessed it would be. Um, there is still some significant improvement, particularly in wind, right? this is wind on the left. Um, but the differences are pretty small, especially they're smaller than the differences you get going from six hourly to hourly um, and not much improvement in temperature. Um, which to me was actually, you know, the optimist, I'm gonna say this actually means that the overlapping windows handles those latent observations pretty well, as opposed to um, we should be dumping a bunch of money into trying to get these observations more quickly. So that was promising. Um, so this was all work that was published. As I said, um, the rest of the talk, I'll be sort of going into more of our recent work. So it's a little bit uh, less polished, I guess. <laughs> I apologize for that, but, um, but it's been really interesting, I think. So the main question we wanted to then understand, ignoring the latency issue, and just focusing on the improvements that we see from cycling hourly versus six hourly, where are those improvements actually coming from? Can we like figure out where they're coming from and potentially why they don't last? So we have a few hypotheses. Some of them have pretty clean answers to whether they're true or not and others are still ongoing. So um, I'll go through each of these in the next slide. So the first one we thought about was, you know, the increments are gonna be smaller in the hourly cycling system because you're not assimilating as many OBS. Obviously, you're only assimilating an hour's worth instead of six hours worth. Um, does that lead to more balanced backgrounds? The answer is definitely no, and I'll show you that. Um, there's also been work out of ECMWF showing that in the 4D VAR system, the observations at the end of your 4D VAR window are the most impactful. So in other words, you might think that assimilating observations closer to the time they were taken is gonna be more useful. I'll show this, is, doesn't seem to be the whole story, it's a little bit of it. And then more recently we've started looking into these questions of um, whether hourly cycling can more effectively keep accurate small scale signals, so not just any small scale signals, but like the true small scale signals, uh, maybe. And then again, fewer observations are assimilated per cycle, Potentially, I'm not really gonna talk about this too much, but potentially that means that the ensemble can actually span the observation space more effectively and s sort of better match the observations than you could if you dumped in six hours worth. I would love to hear uh, suggestions for how we could actually, um, for how we could actually like test this hypothesis. So it's, it sort of makes sense, but haven't really been able to run experiments to test it. So, um, First, just looking at increments, these are 200 millibar meridional wind increments. Um, on the left is the six hourly system, on the right is the hourly system, just to sort of, sort of show that yes, the increments are smaller in the hourly system um, because fewer OBS are gonna be going into each uh, hourly cycle. So does that mean that it's less imbalanced? And by imbalance, I mean the inconsistencies between physical variables 
in an NWP model state, which can lead to propagation of unrealistic gravity waves in a forecast or even in a cycling system. To measure this, I'm looking at one hour surface pressure tendency. Uh, and this is just sort of a time series movie of surface pressure tendency from a system that is not balanced, becomes very unbalanced, and you can see these gravity wave like signals start to dominate um, the whole field. I also just mentioned that localization leads to imbalance, even if your background state is balanced, just by function of the localization, um, and increments off the dynamical slow manifold attractor can project onto these gravity waves. So the main point here is that the surface pressure tendency metric is gonna be uh, what I use to measure this imbalance. So if we look at, oh, and I'll mention um, imbalance because it also could show up in the six hourly system. It's been mitigated in operations for years. The way that we're mitigating it is with a 4D incremental analysis update uh, and a tangent linear normal mode constraint. And I'm not gonna talk about the details of those, but they are included in our six hourly system. We added the 3D versions of those to the hourly system, again, 3D because it's just an hour long window. Um, even with that, we end up with a slightly higher global mean surface pressure tendency in the hourly system than the six hourly. I apologize, these numbers are really small. Um, the black is about 0.4, 0.45, and the um, red averages to about 0.6. So, and this is about a month of cycling time. So we see that it doesn't really, it's larger in the hourly system, but it seems pretty stable in terms of the, the um, time mean for the cycling. I've also looked at the forecast and it doesn't grow in the forecast either. So I'm not too worried about the imbalance dominating in the longer forecast either. Um, so the hourly cycling actually performs better than the six hourly cycling uh, despite the larger imbalance, not because it has less imbalance. So the next hypothesis that we um, sort of considered was this um, fact that the hourly cycling maybe makes better use of recent observations based on that study uh, out of ECMWF on the 40 var observation impact. So returning to that GFS GDAS um, cutoffs. We can sort of try to look at this in our, uh, in our system. So this is just a uh, histogram of the number of observations per hour in the window for the GFS cutoff in blue, that early cutoff, and the GDAS, or the late cutoff in orange. And this is just to show how quickly you lose observations at the end of your window, hours five and six, in the GFS versus in the GDAS. You still lose some in the GDAS, which was um, a little surprising to me, actually. But So what we can do is take our six hourly system, assimilate the GFS OBS and cycle, and then take our six hourly system and assimilate the GDAS OBS and cycle, see the improvement there, and then do the same thing for the hourly system. And if we see more of an improvement in the hourly system than we saw in the six hourly system, then that might suggest that the hourly system can use those observations more effectively than the six hourly system. So we look at the six hourly system, there's some improvement. The GDAS is in red, so more OBS, slight significant, significant but not very big um, improvement in wind, a little bit in temperature, um, than if we had fewer OBS at the end of the window. Then when we look at the same comparison in the hourly system, it looks pretty similar. There's maybe a little bit more improvement um, there's a bit more levels of significance in wind, um, but actually not almost no difference in temperature. Um, so this seems like it's not the whole story, right? It's not that the hourly cycling system can use those extra observations much more effectively than the six hourly cycling system, although that's maybe a little bit. That's definitely not the whole story. So we then started thinking about this um, question of representing the small spatial scales by actually cycling hourly, not needing to have a background state that is a six hour model forecast and just having a background state that's an hour, back, uh, an hour forecast might be able to keep those small scales better. So one, the, sort of one of the things we looked at here was to compare with the HER. So this is our high res regional system in the US. Um, we can sort of, assume that the HER is gonna represent the small scales better than our half a degree global system. So we have 
again, vertical profiles of our RMSE. Uh, the hourly system is in red here, and the six hourly is in blue. Um, we see a significant improvement in wind in the upper levels and near the surface. Not very much, actually. It's the opposite sign, although it's not significant um, in the mid-levels. Uh, and there's not very much difference in temperature. Um, just quickly, we can look at a map of that vector wind at 200 millibars, which is right about here, um, and see that the improvement, so the blue is where the hourly fits her better than the six hourly. And we see it's mostly over CONUS, but um, so we're seeing that the hourly system is fitting the her better, but again, this doesn't really answer the question of whether it's the small scales or not, but we do at least have um, another comparison data point here. So what we did next um, to sort of try to get at this, hope, well, one of the hypotheses is that it sort of gets at this small scale question, um, is to do some data denial experiments with aircraft. So aircraft are dense in situ observations. So if we remove them, um, we can sort of, it, it seems like they would measure these small scales uh, well and you know, more potentially more accurately than um, Satellites, maybe. So we got some pretty interesting results from this, actually. So I'm showing here, I've changed the colors, I apologize. The red and the orange are basically the curves I'd shown before. So the red is the six hourly with aircraft, and the orange is the hourly with aircraft. Again, we see that consistent improvement with the hourly over the six hourly. The dark blue and the light blue are the six hourly and hourly when we don't assimilate aircraft. Um, but we're keeping aircraft in the verifying observations here in these calculations. Um, and we see almost no difference. So that was interesting to, to me, even though we're still keeping our full, um, all of the other observations, right? We're still assimilating all of the satellites and all the other in situ observations. But when we don't assimilate aircraft, we don't see any improvement in the fit um, to the aircraft that weren't assimilated or to any of the other observations. And if we actually leave the aircraft out of our verification, now we're only comparing with other in situ observations that are not aircraft, we hardly see a difference in either one. So even when we do assimilate aircraft, we don't actually see an improvement in the fit to the other in situ observations. This was also pretty surprising to us, actually. Um, so that was interesting. We can look at fits to um, satellite winds. I'm only looking at geostationary satellites here. If you look at the polar orbiters, it's actually the opposite, which um, was interesting to me. But we do see small improvements in both of the hourly experiments relative to satellite winds and the six hourly experiments in upper level wind uh, and in these sort of mid-level winds, um, regardless of whether aircraft were assimilated. So, the improvements from hourly cycling seem to be mostly due to the assimilation of aircraft, with the exception of this. Um, and the improvements are mostly, with the exception of this, only seen relative to the aircraft observations. So this is sort of something that we're still trying to wrap our heads around uh, in terms of why, what's so special about aircraft. And it's it might be this issue of the scales and the frequency and just the the fact that there are a lot of aircraft observations. And so it might be difficult to see any improvement relative to other observations because there just aren't nearly as many as when we um, include aircraft in our, in our comparisons. So that the, the next few slides are going to be uh, very much more recent work, so much less polished. But we can actually, if I'm going to talk about scales, I might as well show some kinetic energy spectra, right? So I'm showing um, 200 millibar kinetic energy spectra here. It's averaged over um, about a week of data that we have. And again, from our four experiments with and without aircraft. Um, the, there's almost no difference when you assimilate aircraft, actually. I think it increases it, uh, the energy a tiny bit, but it's sort of hard to see. What was, and these are from the analyses, what was sort of surprising to me, actually, is that the six hourly experiments, these darker colors, have more energy at the smaller scales than the hourly analyses, which was, again, not what I expected. Um, so then we have to ask maybe the, the small scale energy from the six hourly system is just noise. Because 
they're, it's not fitting the observations as well, but it has more energy at those scales. So um, trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, the other interesting thing is that we can look at, so the previous slide was looking at the analyses. We can also look at the spectra of the three, six, and nine hour forecasts that go into the backgrounds of each cycle. Um, from, we have the six hourly experiment on the left and the hourly on the right. So even though the six hourly experiment starts with more energy at small scales, it rapidly loses that energy. So you can barely see the, you know, the blue, orange, and green are gonna be the forecast hours. Beyond that, it loses a lot of energy and then just kind of stabilizes there. Whereas in the hourly cycling system, it starts with less energy but sort of doesn't lose it as quickly, which might mean that that is gonna be more accurate, more close to the truth. Not really sure, but I thought that was um, interesting. Both of these have been sort of interesting question marks in the work. So, um, sorry, I went through this like way faster than I expected, but in any case, um, just to quickly summarize, we do see, despite all these question marks at the end, we do see that the hourly updating DA does improve upon the six hourly DA uh, in, this, in these metrics that I've looked at. Um, for real-time implementation, data latency is a challenge, but overlapping windows seems to be a pretty promising option for actually um, solving that challenge. Uh, results suggest, in the vaguest possible way, I can say results suggest that hourly cycling can make better use of observations, particularly aircraft. More details on that, I really, it's, it's sort of been difficult for me to, to pin that down any further. Um, besides pinning that down, other challenges, again, our improvements disappear at longer lead times, so figuring out the cost-benefit analysis of actually doing this um, operationally um, I think we'll need a little bit more work. The other challenge that I did not mention but has been sort of the huge computational elephant in the room um, is the expense. And this has motivated, the, the silver lining is that it's motivated development of InCore DA in our lab um, because it's actually the IO in this, at an hourly frequency, it's the IO that starts to dominate your time. It's not even the um, forecaster analysis to the point where the reason that all these experiments are done at half a degree is because when you try to run at higher, higher than half a degree, uh, you can't even fit an hour cycle in an hour of computational time, which has been frustrating for trying to run, <laughs> run experiments. <clears throat> um, so we do have some, in addition to the sort of ongoing work I showed here, um, some ongoing and future work, we've started looking at surface observation assimilation to uh, potentially improve the representation of the boundary layer in the global system. <clears throat> so that's one thing you would need to do if you wanted to get rid of that intermediary model between the global and the regional um, is to actually improve the boundary layer. That's one of the things that intermediary does. And so if we were to go straight from the global to the regional, we'd need a better boundary layer potentially by assimilating two meter observations, say. Um, coming back to those regional models, how to actually implement a global hourly updating system with the forthcoming Rufus, potentially nesting is also actually um, work that's gonna be supported by the same project that'll support this in core DA. It's actually focused on um, atmospheric rivers. Uh, and then ocean atmosphere coupling, because NOAA's operational system is going towards a weekly coupled ocean atmosphere system. All of this has been done in an atmosphere only system where we have a given data latency and given time scales in the dynamics. When you add in this ocean um, this, with totally different scales and actually much longer data latency issues, uh, then you need to start thinking about how you could have an hourly updating atmosphere, whether it's beneficial and how you would update the ocean um, to, to see the same benefits in the atmosphere. So, um, thanks, yeah, sorry that was so short, thank you. We got time for questions, comments? Dave? Hi, I was wondering about in this age of satellites, constellations, and instantaneous communications, why the satellite data takes over two hours to get. I mean, if, could it really help if somehow that was reduced to the same as airplanes, for example? Yeah, I, uh, 
I don't know, actually. Um, I don't know if anyone else does, but <clears throat> I think it has to do with, um, I mean, it's partially like processing and quality control and all this stuff that has to happen before you can actually assimilate it. Um, but otherwise, I think it's just like communication links. I mean, you know, satellites are observing on the other side of the world and have to make it over here. And so sometimes there is some, um, some limitations. But I think my understanding is that they're not actually like physical limitations. It's just you could throw money at the problem and make it go away. Um, but, you know, one of the things I was looking at was whether it's or what kind of gain you would get, not necessarily like an actual analysis, but um, less than we expected, I guess. For the aircraft observations, they're getting bias corrected, right? Mm -hmm. Have you looked at all? Is there any interaction as you increase the cycling frequency? Does the bias correction change? Um, I've looked at it a little bit, not a lot. Um, and the satellite bias correction, too, just to see what if, if that seems like it's stable or not. Um, it's different than in the six hourly system, but it doesn't seem like it's crazy. So, but I haven't done any really in-depth analysis of that. Yeah. Okay. But that is a, that is a question too that I also haven't really, um, analyzed, but if you're only assimilating, um, an hour's worth of anchor observations, how does that affect all of this? Um, and, you know, the cursory analysis is that, well, it doesn't seem like it's going wrong and we're seeing, we're not seeing, you know, degradation in the fits to the observations. So it seems like it's okay. <laughs> that was kind of. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, there's a, like you, you choose sort of an effective variance for the bias coefficients, you know, that determines how much they get updated each cycle. And then if you're updating twice, you know, six times as frequently, mm -hmm. and you leave that parameter the same, then it seems like they might move around more. But I guess mm -hmm. that's not what you've seen. Yeah. Okay. But I do want to revisit it, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, we got a question from uh, Craig Schwartz. Thank you for the interesting talk and the overlapping windows method. Why do you only assimilate each observation once? Couldn't it be possible that a given observation doesn't have much of an impact the first time around, but um, re, re assimilating it an hour later could, could uh, yield uh, and continues more of an impact, ignoring something like the time locate localization that could de emphasize the op. Yeah, um, that's a good question. You would probably have to deal with the observation error. Um, we've actually so, like, increase the observation error, probably, if you were going to assimilate it more than once. Um, to be honest, partially, it has been, like, you know, well, as a, as a data assimilator, you can't assimilate an observation more than once. It's sort of just, like, ingrained. Um, we have, I haven't, my colleague has looked at, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but he has tried um, one of these methods where you do assimilate observations twice and you double the observation error. Um, and he didn't see any improvement in it, actually. Um, if you didn't increase the observation error, you'd probably see more of an impact, but then you'd probably be overfitting. Um, but yeah, so, so we've looked at it a little bit but, um, and didn't see much of an impact. But we haven't done it in like the naive way of just letting the late... Um, well, that's the other thing, is if you actually did that in overlapping windows, you would only assimilate the observations with low latency multiple times. The observations with high latency, they'd come in at the end of one window and then they would never get assimilated again. So then you'd be waiting the, the low latency observations and they're not necessarily better, so. But putting aside the, the cost of things, if you were to go to higher resolution instead of a half degree to a quarter degree or eighth degree, with eighth degree is kind of standard now, do you expect the signal to get larger in terms of the differences in these approaches or, or not? Yeah, I mean, if it is this sort of small scale question, then yes, I would um, expect, because you know, you'd be able to capture, 
I think if your model were able to capture those smaller scales, then by having a more frequent update, you would be able to more accurately capture them where the six hourly system might kind of bottom out at some point. Um, but I don't know. And the other thing, I, if you, maybe you will have noticed, that I mentioned hurricanes in the very beginning and then didn't talk about hurricanes. We did some case studies of hurricane forecasts at these lower resolutions, and you just don't see, you know, our hypothesis was that if the hurricane, in six hours, your hurricane can get far enough away from, your forecast can get far enough away from your observation that you end up with like a double eye or some issue here. Um, but at low resolution, we just weren't seeing that effect so like going to higher resolution, you might actually see some of these like smaller scale features that where they're placed really matters. Um, and you can actually like represent that placement and then the hourly system, you might see more of an impact there. Hey, you, you mentioned that, um, that the, you had to go to lower resolutions in order to fit the hourly system into a one hour block. But what if, for, for the purposes of just kind of this, um, uh, for, for these experiments that don't require being on the clock, why not just go to finer resolution at the expense of, yeah, it's going to take a while, but yeah. then you can maybe actually potentially answer some of these, some of these issues of uh, the model being able to resolve finer scale things and maybe actually be able to look at hurricanes or other interesting phenomena? Yeah, so um, I'll be honest. We did try a higher resolution um, test. We were hoping, it's actually like, it takes just over an hour to run at uh, like about quarter degree per cycle. Um, for one thing, to be honest, it's really frustrating. To, you can't run, a, it takes you, you know, a month and a half to two months of real time to run a month long experiment. If you mess something up, then that's two months of your time gone, which happened to us, right? Like we ran a couple weeks and then this imbalance issue actually took over and it was ended up being something kind of stupid in our tuning where we just like had tuned it wrong and you didn't see it for multiple days, which meant in real time it was weeks to a month before we saw it. Um, so honestly, that was part of it. We did look at before it kind of, the imbalance took over, we were able to compare um, and even at a quarter degree for the hurricane case study that we had chosen, uh, we didn't actually see any improvement. So potentially even a quarter degree is not high enough resolution. And then honestly, it's just super frustrating to run for months and then have nothing <laughs> to do that multiple times. Um, I sort of, I got to the point where I decided to just wait until Incore DA is more useful and it can actually run stuff at a reasonable time period. Okay, uh, thanks again, Laura. Thanks. Uh, please, uh, everybody, enjoy, join us for some cookies and coffee and continue the conversation. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Again.